Hello, I am Rev. Troy Tresh, Senior Pastor of Resurrection Metropolitan Community Church. At this time full of chaos where it's hard to catch our breath, I turn to Scripture. And I want to share with you today a passage from Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. They have dressed the wound of my people with very little care, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. I'm Rev. Vicki Gibbs, and... I'm the associate pastor here at Resurrection MCC, and when moments like this, I go to the Psalms. In particular, I go to Psalm 137. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors ask us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord? Well, in a foreign land. Both the passages we've read to you today come from the middle of a story. We get the anguish and we get the hope for things to be different, but they're in the middle of chaos, in the middle of pain, in the middle of suffering. And we come to you today when our country and our people are in the middle of pain. Uh, it's not the beginning of the story, it's the middle of the story. The pain and suffering and killings have been going on for a long time. What we see today is right, righteous indignation by people who care for themselves and care for others that there may be justice. Uh, we support those who lift their own voices for their own health and for their own welfare and for their own rights. Uh, we, we support also ways in which we do this through protest that doesn't escalate it to levels of military involvement, escalate it to levels of warfare. Uh, the militar militarization of this uh, misses the point. Uh, of the p pain and suffering and injustice that's going on and has been going on for a long, long time. For over 400 years now, uh, people who look like me have been three-fifths citizens in this country. As of yet, we have not cashed that promissory note that Dr. King speaks of America has yet to pay that check. The pain, the anguish, the frustration that is evident in the protesters at this time are centuries old. You know, I, I recorded my sermon for next week, yesterday. And I say that we have not reached our Pentecost moment here in America, a time when all people are, treat, are created and treated equally in this country. I weep when I watch Ahmaud Arbery. I weeped when I heard of Breonna Taylor I sobbed when I watched the life lead George Floyd. For two minutes, he was unresponsive out of nine minutes of being held down with a knee on his neck. He was dead before they put him on the gurney. That the officers who were there didn't protect him, didn't serve him is what we witness all too often. This has got to stop. We didn't immediately speak out because we wanted to see how this was going to play out. What was going to happen? We, I, I, I will speak only for me, I am thrilled that um, the officer has been arrested. Do I believe that the charges are sufficient? No. Do I believe that the other officers need to be charged as well? Yes. 
and I pray to God that that happens. Because then I believe that the folks in, in, in Minneapolis will, will feel, will be able to take a breath that they will be able to at least believe for a moment that justice can also be had for Mr. Floyd and his family. So I pray for justice as I pray for change. I pray for everyone to be able to breathe. I, I, I pray for the mayor of Minneapolis to forbid chokeholds and for all mayors of all cities and all police departments to discontinue any use of these illegal practices or immoral practices at least to choke the breath out of others. I invite all of our armed forces uh, of whatever nature to, to recognize that taking a breath themselves and taking a moment to step back can save lives. We all need the space to be able to breathe. Chokeholds have no place in our world, they have no place in our society, and they have no place for people we trust to keep the peace, trust to enforce what we hope is a way of living worth living these days. Uh, it's right to be angry. It's right to be overwhelmed. Uh, it's right to be anxious. All, all of the feelings that come from this chaos are human. It's even right to be numb because there's been so much of it uh, that it's hard to um, even be able to feel sometimes. Uh, all of these things are okay for us to feel and be a part of. Um, my prayer is that we use all our feelings, all our emotions, and even our numbness, to ask the right questions and to take the right actions so that we can bring power to a place that's been powerless and that we can change behavior, change systemic white supremacy and racism, change the laws that have been in place for a long time. When we see people destroying property, we might be appalled but we might also be grateful that they're not killing people. When we see people in frustration and anger and feeling uh, little power to change a system that's arranged against them, destroying a piece of property, we might should be grateful that they aren't using guns and weapons and killing those who've been causing them harm. Dr. Andrea Matthews of Rice University says when black people have responded to white people coming into black churches and killing church members mm -hmm. by destroying property, that we are witnessing grace because they are not responding in kind to the violence that's been perpetuated upon them. Can we see these moments of pain and chaos as revealing of what has been for a long time? Can we even be thankful that there's grace involved even now? Can we be aware of those agitators that will come in and try and make it worse, that will try and make violence even more so? Can we look for those and, and know that that's happening? I support Black Lives Matter. I support the core values. I support what they've been about for a long time. I'm also aware that people come in and use their activities to create violence. And we need to be aware that those agitators are not welcome. Their goal is not justice. Their goal is not freedom. Their goal is not peace. Their goal is chaos. And so as we support the voices being raised and the actions being taken in the middle of what's been going on for a long time, May we be aware of how we try to assign blame where it doesn't belong. As I was reading this morning in the newspaper and on, online, that all of the people who have been arrested thus far in Minneapolis have been people who don't even live in Minnesota. So we are, are sure that there are outside agitators who are attempting to create the very chaos that is happening 
in their cities in this moment. We have heard from um, the elected officials in those cities that the folks who are coming in to do this agitation are not local people because they have been speaking with the organizers and with uh, the activists who are uh, on the ground there. And they know that it is not their folks who are doing, the, the local community who is, is um, engaging in this violence, engaging in this creation of chaos. I was thrilled yesterday when um, Ashton would uh, create it, well, ran the demonstration for Black Lives Matter here in Houston. Um, all the reporting from that event, from the two o'clock to four o'clock when they concluded their event, it was a peaceful, peaceful protest. What happened afterwards with people coming in and, and um, riling up the, the situation, um, again, outside folks who were not having Black Lives Matter or the, the um, deaths of black people, in particular um, Mr. Floyd, um, they didn't have his, that best interest. And I, I encourage all of our activists, all of our organizers to continue to lead peaceful protest, to continue championing for equality and for justice, and to name those who are coming from the outside, creating chaos. And we know peaceful means you can get arrested. Uh, we know peaceful means that it's a higher risk for those who carry out civil disobedience because they choose to put their values into play as they seek to change these systems that are so aggressive and so violent towards uh, people of color. Uh, we recognize that peacefulness doesn't mean that you will be at peace uh, and that you might actually be treated badly. Uh, we know here at Resurrection that the journey is long and we know that we're not gonna say peace, peace where there is no peace. We know that we will walk with you through the fire, into the chaos, through the anger, in the depression, in the numbness, that we will walk with you through all of these things purposefully gathering all the information from our hearts and souls that we can so that we can use that to make change. But we will be with you each and every step of the way. We will hold vigils. We will participate in marches. We will offer uh, ways to change votes at elections. We will offer policies and what you can do to make those change here and federally as well. Uh, we are not going to sit still we are going to move forward. Immediately, we're talking now about how we can vigil together at this time uh, to, to honor the breath of a man who could not breathe while a knee was upon his neck for nine minutes. And I know each of us have already committed to doing our own nine minute vigil. We're trying to figure out how we all might do that together. Uh, to know that experience even just a bit. You saw the fear and terror on his face. The videos are clear. This is not who we need to be. This is not who God calls us to be. Jesus didn't want us to lay down. Jesus taught us how to resist taught us how to change the structures that were against the people who were occupied and marginalized. We need to be those disciples today. So we ask that you stay tuned because we will be posting information about how we will vigil together, how we will protest together, how we will stand for justice together. We are not finished yeah. and we will not be finished until there is justice and equality for all. Yeah. And how we learn together. For all you white people out there, um, we need our own education and we need to train each other and not expect people who've been abused and marginalized to help educate us. So we'll be offering a class soon about white, good white racists. Do your own work. 
look at the statistics of what's going on in our country and world, join the class, ask the questions. You can be a part of the solution. You can be a part of what changes and transforms the world by learning what you're doing right now that's causing harm. People of resurrection and those who, who uh, walk beside us. We thank you for your love and your support in this time. And I ask that you hang on to your anger <laughs> because it can motivate us to truly create change in the world. Both in the Psalms and one of Paul's letters, the, the verse starts out with two words in it, be angry. Don't hide it. Don't pretend it's not there. Don't deny it. It says, be angry. There are many things it's worth being angry for. And it's worth lifting your voice for. It's worth taking the risk to make sure that we can transform the world. So be angry as we change the world together. Amen. Amen.